Welcome back. Again, we're interviewing Dr. Brenda Gorman, and we're talking about bilingual issues, bilingual speech language pathology issues, and we're going to continue our conversation. And if we would like to talk about treatment and working with uh, bilingual clients and providing appropriate therapy services. Could you please comment on that? Yes, we've made great strides in appropriate assessment methods for bilingual speakers. Uh, relative to intervention, it's, it's a fun area. Um, however, we still really are in, uh, it's really in its infancy. Um, We've spent so much time over the past several decades, uh, not only in speech language pathology, but really in the field of education about uh, making it a yes or no issue. Should we provide bilingual instruction or not? Should it be bilingual or should it be monolingual? So, um, and the decades of research has really made it very clear that bilingual does work um, and it's not it's no longer an issue of quantity but again it's an issue of quality so uh, again the research is, it has examined the quantity issue at such length that really now I, I think we're ready much more ready to look at the quality how do we do uh, not only bilingual education but how do we provide bilingual uh, intervention to our clients in speech language therapy uh, however, we don't have a lot of research to guide us. So we do have some studies, for example, early on by Perozzi and Chavez Sanchez, who did some of the earliest work that I'm aware of, showing that the bilingual intervention does benefit even uh, children's English skills. Uh, some more recent work, for example, by Lugo Neris and colleagues, again, that the uh, the first language input can support the second language in intervention and very importantly that it doesn't uh, slow kids down. Okay. It doesn't slow their, their progress down in, in intervention, which I think a lot of clinicians are, are interested in because we obviously want to make progress as quickly as possible. Yes. And um, if the dual language intervention doesn't slow kids down, that's great. However, uh, some of our own research that you and I published and some other research that I've been working on that might suggest that it, it can even enhance and speed up kids' learning. So uh, again, n nothing completely surprising because we have seen that in bilingual education. But again, the, the base in uh, speech language pathology and intervention, again, it, it's pretty new. And um, it'll be a fun area. We have a lot more to learn. So we know, for example, that bilinguals, uh, we're talking about such a heterogeneous population that I don't really anticipate a one method for all kids. So. And I think clinicians who, again, in the absence of research, but who do, um, who did know intuitively that bilingual intervention does meet children's needs, both school needs as well as home and community needs. So clinicians have been using various methods for a long time. So in some settings, for example, uh, when clinicians have been available, perhaps a one clinician, one language, another clinician, the other language. So for example, one clinician might treat in Spanish for a bilingual child and another English speaking clinician might work on English with that child. Uh, which sounds pretty ideal because a lot of uh, clinicians it might not be feasible in many different settings. So clinicians have also used, I know in some research, we used an alternating day model, uh, particularly for, for children for whom Spanish was the stronger language and they were emerging in English. So we would present them uh, lessons first in Spanish, obviously to enhance their Spanish skills. And then when we presented materials, storybooks, vocabulary, uh, background knowledge, narrative knowledge, they already had some knowledge having uh, had all that in Spanish to help facilitate their, their comprehension and make it comprehensible in English. Um, however, that might not work with all children as well. So uh, very recently, uh, one of my students who I had in class, she was uh, the clinician assigned to work with a child that had been seen in our uh, my previous clinic for a while, and uh, she was asking because the, the child was six, I think um, close to turning seven, 
Uh, Spanish was the language of the home. English was the language of the child's education, a severe language impairment. And the clinician had been using an alternating day model, which again, a lot of us mm -hmm. do. Um, but it wasn't working for him. Uh, he was, what they were doing was uh, first targeting, let's say, Monday, the lesson in English, and then let's say the other day he came to therapy that week, Wednesday in Spanish, but the same lesson, and the child wasn't responding. So he was, or he wasn't responding as well as hoped. He was making progress in English. Uh, he was not making very strong progress in Spanish, and so the recommendation was going to be that therapy continue in English. Uh, and my student, good for her, asked asked me about it, sought my advice, um, and I recommended trying some other things first because if we take away a language, you know, again, we have to think outside of our speech language room. We have to think about that child's life. So if we take right. away a language, uh, we can't just think, okay, what does progress look like on paper? But it's it's a huge decision. What impact does that have on the child's life? His home life, or again, the language was Spanish. His uh, extended family life, uh, the family did visit their home country every year, um, and the future. So you know, also being a bilingual adult, I've never heard of an adult um, who regretted learning both languages. <laughs> However, I know a lot of adults who regretted that their parents didn't teach them the other language, right? So, um, and again, it opens up many opportunities down the road, employment opportunities. So again, it's a huge decision that SLPs really need to think very holistically uh, about language. Um, and so removing a language from intervention is, is, a, is a big deal. We have to think very long and hard about that. And what happened in this situation with the, with the client that you're mm -hmm. uh, supervising in terms of uh, that they were having alternating uh, days of therapy. What yes. is it that worked for this client? Well, we tried something else. So rather than, again, I talked about in another clip that bilingualism is very visible, but I think, as, and as you mentioned, that you know we need to look at other things as well. So in this case, rather than um, latching onto that, we said, well, what can the clinician do? Is there something that the clinician can do differently? Is there something that can be changed in the therapy plan? So what I recommended is getting uh, more information from the parents. What would uh, make the Spanish more relevant to the child? So if he wasn't particularly interested in repeating the lesson that he had already done in English, uh, asking the family what would uh, make it more rewarding for him. So that's what the clinician did. She interviewed the parents and uh, based on that modified the, the activities. And then a second thing I recommended was rather than alternating day, which he didn't seem to be responding to, uh, to block intervention. So um, I recommended, you know, from two to four weeks in one language and then the second two to four weeks in treating the other language if that would make it more thematic for him so that they could uh, give him more increased exposure to a particular theme uh, that again based on parent input might be more relevant to him. Okay. And I think given the um, the number of weeks in the semester I think they did something like that maybe three week blocks uh, but they did exactly that and the parents one activity I remember that they uh, requested was that the family really enjoyed going to McDonald's. Of course, we're talking about a six-year-old boy. What six-year-old doesn't love going to McDonald's? And and this is not a plug. A commercial <laughs> plug. <laughs> exactly. And so, and I think I know the exact McDonald's in Milwaukee they might be talking about because it, it was it was really all Spanish. It was um, everything was in Spanish at this McDonald's. Um, the kids on the at the play area, uh, the people. Uh, working at McDonald's, it was really predominantly Spanish speaking, and the family enjoyed that. So um, they said, you know, it would be really great if we can go to McDonald's and he can order the food himself and we can have a discussion, and that would be very rewarding and fun for him. Great. So now we know what is val valued by the family. Um, of course, they're experts in their child, so they're, they're going to know what would be more motivating for him. And the clinician responded to that, and then she made the Spanish theme that they continued for a while, all about McDonald's and food, uh, food categories, all the verbs um, associated with that, the scripts necessary for that. Um, and so that block method he responded to 
so much better. And I interviewed the father at the end of the semester, uh, and I was uh, trying to be relatively systematic, and you know, I, I didn't know how he was going to respond either, so I didn't have any particular, you know, I wasn't trying to push this method, but I gave him the five choices. Do you feel this is much more effective? All the way down to uh, not effective. And before I could finish the list, he was, you know, much more effective. Mucho más efectivo. He was so happy with the way that therapy had progressed that semester. Um, I mean, really thrilled. It was an extremely rewarding moment because, again, the parent knew the impact. This is their home language. This is very important to them. Um, they were they were ready at the beginning of the semester to do whatever the supervisor had recommended, so they were ready and willing to let go of the English if that was best for their child. But once they saw that, that, that their child responded very well in keeping both languages, they were thrilled. The clinician was thrilled. I was very happy that something else worked. Uh, so again, it's going back to the research. In the absence of research, uh, we need to be creative. And I think what works for one client might not work for others. Uh, but again, what we've seen in bilingual education, it's not a quantity issue, it's quality. So we are the professionals. Uh, we need to problem solve and to think outside the box. And again, um, just think of what might work. So, so what I hear you saying is that it wasn't necessarily the it wasn't the language issue, yes. and so instead of removing that language, mm -hmm. you sought to look at what the clinician was doing, mm -hmm. sought to interview the parents, mm -hmm. and so instead of duplicating the lesson that he mm -hmm. was receiving in Spanish, mm -hmm. and he might have been bored, might have been fatigued, mm -hmm. you decided not to have it on alternating days, but have it in alternating time blocks, mm -hmm. and you looked at what was relevant in terms of that child, what Absolutely. the parents wanted, and what that child wanted in, in terms of being able to communicate mm -hmm. and so you brought it down to a, a relevant issue mm -hmm. being able to order food and a restaurant mm -hmm. and being able to you know alternate the times mm -hmm. and so that seemed to work so again it wasn't you know the language that was needed to be focusing on it was how the therapy was being provided mm -hmm. exactly so that theme is just one idea um, hopefully at some point I'd love to talk with the clinician more to, to learn about the other activities because she did excellent work with him. Um, but again, yes, that's that's the issue. We need to be uh, more creative in, in, in modifying what we do to make it work. I also hear you you're saying that if you have a skill in one language, mm -hmm. in one mode, that that skill can transfer to the other mode because mm -hmm. earlier you were talking about uh, evidence-based practices, mm -hmm. efficiency in terms of providing therapy services, mm -hmm. and, and targeting objectives across the two languages. So if the child can acquire that one language, you don't have to reteach it in the mm -hmm. other language. Exactly. That that concept or that aspect mm -hmm. should be able to transfer. Yes, and this really goes back to the issue of what it takes to be a bilingual SLP again, not just the language knowledge, but really that awareness. As one example, um, an SLP who really recognizes how to be efficient, that some things like you're saying can transfer, um, what things might transfer, and then uh, the awareness that we need to monitor that progress uh, to observe if there is transfer and then to get in there and target something directly if there isn't transfer. Uh, but another really important concept is that we're working with bilingual brains. We're not working with monolingual brains. So if we think of the complexity of this neurological network, um, it's all the more complex in a bilingual brain and um, that child, for example, had been learning Spanish since birth, a good six, seven years, uh, English just a couple of years in school. And so again, it's not a, a one or the other issue. That's what the child has learned. All of this neurological network has been established with that input. Um, and so yes, we do anticipate, uh, or we need to think that we're looking at a whole system. We're not looking at two Separate, separate systems, that's a good point mm -hmm. to make, uh, and I think uh, uh, Francois Grosjean mentions in, the, in mm -hmm. his 1989 article yes. of Neurolinguals Beware, the, monolingual, the bilingual is mm -hmm. not two monolinguals, mm -hmm. and that a bilingual person is really a unique individual, that they are not Absolutely. two monolinguals. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. That was great. Okay, good. Thank you. My pleasure.